Director of Conservation at Chicago Botanic Garden, and he is also an avid urban gardener who's been growing natives in containers for 15 years. Um, he's actually a molecular ecologist who uses genetic tools to study ecological questions. Um, I guess container gardening is sort of a, a, a passionate side of me, if you will. Um, he studies the genetics of rare plants, how pollinators drive plant genetics, uh, restoration genetics, and the role of botanic gardens in restoration. Um, and as I said, Nicholas Dorian will be, his student will be, or not his, I should say his colleague, not his student, um, and will be coming in at the end with a little bit about pollinator gardens, because I understand he's been studying how to make our car pollinator gardens more effective. So take it away, Jeremy. Thank you, Adrian and Laura, for the invitation. Um, I'm excited to talk about this. I have some slides. Um, try to keep them uh, very light on science, so lots of photos. Um, let's see if I can get this. Okay, so hopefully you're just seeing the slides and not everything else. But um, yes, so as was mentioned, um, I have been planting native plants on my um, my urban Chicago um, apartment for 15 years. Um, and from that, I have, being a scientist and a gardener, I recorded everything that I planted, recorded when it died, recorded when it flowered, recorded everything. So I have just, being the nerd I am, collected a lot of data. Um, and 15 years seems a good time to maybe talk about what I've learned in that in that period. Um, Normally, I, in, in an in-person meeting, I would be happy for people to, to throw questions out as I go, but um, I think it might be easier on Zoom to just do this at the end. But um, I just want to say that I'm going to keep everything sort of very light. Um, I'm going to sort of touch on a lot of key points, but not go into too much depth. Um, and I think um, if anyone wants to reach out, please do at any point. I'm happy to talk about this at any time. Um, I'm also happy to share any of the raw data. Um, I have all the spreadsheets you could want um if you want them um down to the details um i'm happy to share that as well um but this is just going to be a very cursory over the broad strokes um discussion uh, hopefully more entertaining than sciencey um but rest assured that there is some uh, data behind it that i'm happy to share at any point for anyone who wants it um and so yeah just reach out to me or to laura adrian and let them know that you want my email address and i'm happy to to follow through um just a bit background on me. Um, I am a conservation scientist at Chicago Botanic Gardens. Um, I did my undergraduate in horticulture in Australia. Um, so what means what native means to me has changed a lot from place to place I've moved. Um, um, I actually studied hort to look at putting native plants into horticulture with the idea of the floriculture trade and many Australian plants. Um, do well in vases. And so the idea was to increase the diversity of flowering plants we can see. Um, I then went on to do a PhD in genetics and that's where that molecular ecology comes. I love genetics. I love all things genetics. And so I'm also happy if you want to engage in a conversation about genetics too, if you're interested. Um, but I've always had a passion for gardening. Um, however, when I moved to, the, when I bought in the Chicago area, I decided to live in the Wicker Park area um, I didn't have a yard with that. I was restricted to having a balcony. Um, and so my choices of what I could do and how gardening was going to happen for me um, was slightly different um, and restricted. So I have a very typical sort of Chicago type ba balcony. Um, here's a photo of a balcony outside my window. This is not my balcony, it's my neighbor's, but you can see the sort of thing that you would see throughout Chicago, right? And I think many balconies you'll see through the city um, they have a few chairs. They always have the a barbecue. You can see two barbecues in this picture, um, but you know, not always potted plants. Um, but I decided that I was going to use my space as best I could. Um, it's only five by ten foot. Um, we do want to spend time outside, so we needed space for pots and we needed space for me and um, to hang outside and the dogs. Um, I have a south facing. Um, balcony so I get a lot of sun and um, I, but I do have trees out front which have slowly grown in and are starting to shade my balcony so I think my pots are going to change over the next few years as the tree gets bigger um, and I may have to do some modifications but I think as all gardeners do I love playing around and modifying as I go so okay to start with uh, 2008 there was no big tree outside my house it was sunny hot 
balcony and I knew all I knew I was I wanted to grow native plants. Um, I, I value the benefit that native plants bring, no matter where I am in the world. Um, but I was clear that, and this is the scientist in me, I wanted to find what was my goal, right? I Even then, even though this was just something fun, I knew I wanted to have restrictions of what I wanted. And there were a few things that really were going to play out, right? So I, I definitely wasn't going to grow an oak tree on my balcony. That wasn't going to happen. Um, but even the tall grass prairie, um, which is probably more sort of the native potted plants uh, scenario I was looking for, also wasn't really realistic in my mind. Um, having big blue on my in a pot um, on my balcony, having this six foot grass and then sylphium, you know, six eight foot um, daisies, they would just blow over in the wind. They wouldn't be stable. I knew there was a good chance that they would just look lanky and lean over and break. Um, and so. I decided that my goal was to create a very diverse um, or potted array of something similar to what I consider a short grass prairie. Um, short grass prairies are usually found more um, west of here, but in Illinois, um, we see a lot of short grass prairies on sand, sand dunes. We see them on gravel hills. Even wetlands um, can have very short grasses. So I decided that there are a few things um, that I was going to look for in the plant species. So the tall grass prairie and the, the flora, if you look at the flora of Chicago, there are thousands of plants I could choose from. Um, but my restriction was that it would have to be something that was grasslandy-ish um, and it wouldn't be generally above three or four feet tall. I wanted color, I wanted sort of a display, so something a little bit showy. Um, and so I had, a, you know, this wasn't gonna be what, pure on wild um, prairie on my balcony. It was going to be a, a little showy sort of pretty prairie um, with a lot of, of the shorter members of, of the prairie community. <laughs> the first thing I had to deal with was the pot choice. Um, I've seen everyone, I don't know how everyone may have seen already those great photos or images of the roots of the tall grass prairie plants that go very deep and very far. Um, and so I knew that I was going to have to have deep pots. You know, I thought I realized that if um, I'm going to grow these tall plants or these tall grass prairie plants, that they're going to need a lot of root room. And so I went for the biggest pots I could find. Um, here's one of actual pot that I was using. I, I can't the three foot by three foot by. No, it's three. Well, whatever. I can give you the dimensions, but they were large. It was fairly large, as large as I could carry up the stairs, um, three two flights of stairs, um, and get in the. Uh, onto my balcony. Um, other things that I needed to consider, I knew the biggest uh, problem for plants in the prairie, I didn't want to plant a prairie every spring. Um, I wanted to have something that hopefully could persist at least a little bit over the winter. And I knew to do that or achieve that, I would have to insulate the pots. Um, the problem with pots is not that the soils freeze, Chicago plants can handle freezing, um, but it freeze thaws constantly, which creates a sort of a um, it breaks up the roots in a way that's um, not ideal um, and often can result in death. So I, I insulated the inside of the pots with foam. I, I, sometimes I used um, the inside of the, the, the insulation you use in, in walls and that sort of thing, just to line the pots um, to reduce the amount of freeze thaw. Also the heat of the pot. Um, I wanted to make sure that um, the soil remained relatively the same temperature as best as you could achieve. Um, in a pot outside in the balcony. So I took a lot of considerations of making sure that they had a big pot right size and insulated. And then I had to choose soils. Um, choosing soil for a balcony pot, I knew was going to be difficult. I couldn't use just regular soil. Regular soil in a pot um, doesn't have the same structure, doesn't have the same texture, um, and just doesn't respond in the same way once you dig it up and put it into a pot as it does in its nat in the natural sort of where it's open. So I chose a mixture of um, depend. Okay, so one thing I did, which um, shows how nerdy I am, I had four pots, and each pot was, um, in my mind, going to be a different ecosystem. I had one that was going to be a sand ecosystem, one that was going to be a gravel ecosystem, one that was going to be a wetland, and one that was going to be a mini savanna with a tree in it. Um, and so each soil was slightly modified. I used regular potting soil, but I augmented them all. Um, so the one that was gravel hill. I put chunks of um, light but heavy um, vermiculite and other sort of perlite into it to make it lighter. 
um, and to make it drain faster. The sand, I just added extra sand. Um, the wetland, I added extra peat. And then um, for the, the savanna-like one, I just kept the soil regular. Um, but yeah, the details of the type of soil and the um, augmentations I did, I'm happy to share. Um, obviously, the other thing I was considering is how heavy it was. I didn't want the soil to be too heavy. Um, and so I did my best based on what I thought was both light, but you also um, retain some of the, the textures of soil that you'd expect. It turns out, um, and we could go on this a little bit too in the end, is that um, at the Chicago Botanic Gardens at the same time, they were building a green roof and they built a green roof with uh, one side of the green roof has prairie plants on it. That soil is made with no, that roof is made with no actual soil at all. Um, it's a weird clay um, textured sort of soil, which is reconstructed. The soil goes from three, four feet, uh, four inches to, to 12 inches. Um, so it's completely unlike soil. And they managed to get a prairie growing on there, um, big blue, um, all these great prairie species are growing no problems on the roof. So it turns out that my intentions to have deep soil and do all this stuff um, probably wasn't completely necessary, necessary but um, yeah, it's good to think about that when you're starting out. Um, as every gardener knows, preparation is the key. How well your, your plant's going to perform, how long it's going to survive, all depends on the preparation you do with the soil and how you get the pot set up. Um, remember, I also wanted this to go on every year. I didn't want to have to redo this every year. So I was hoping that this would have at least five or six years of, of, of standing up to Chicago winter, Chicago summers and everything else. So I did as much prep as I could to get it ready for the thing. The next thing I need to decide is where to source material. So in native plants are becoming much more easier to find than when I started this. I also work at Chicago Botanic Gardens. So I technically have access to a number of species potentially you won't find in the nursery trade. Um, nonetheless, I what I was interested in was um, I didn't want to use seed because I didn't, I'm not patient. I wanted something fast. So I was using um, transplant seedlings, um, bare roots, prairie moon had um, bare roots and that sort of thing. Um, the other thing I was concerned about was the Chicago winters. I knew that a, a pot is going to feel the freeze and cold much greater than than it would in the soil, the soil being, most soil being fairly well insulated. And so I decided to choose plants from a hardiness zone, which were native, but sourced from Minnesota or somewhere further north, um, intentionally with the idea that if they could grow in a cold hardiness zone a few steps up, then there was a good chance that they could do a little bit better than potentially something collected from the south of here. Um, I don't know if that's true. Maybe it's just the genetic and ecotype person in me that was hoping that that may play a role, but I realized it wouldn't hurt, right? If my um, echinacea came from Minnesota rather than Missouri, I thought uh, Minnesota was probably the better choice because it could handle the cold better. So I started in 2008, um, spring 2008. Um, I bought a, I was very ambitious. I was, you can see I tried Trillium. Um, I tried a lot of things. Uh, I was, I knew this was an experiment. I was going to do whatever. I was going to throw everything in there and just see what came out. Um, I also put in an Amelanchia because I wanted one tree. Um, and I knew that Amelanchia not only has beautiful flowers coming soon, um, but it also has the berries and everything else. And I actually harvest the berries and make jam with them, which is kind of awesome to have um, fruit off your balcony and then you make jam with them. I've also, the Amelanchia is getting a bit old and not doing so great. I actually just planted an American plum in that um, same pot and that's about to flower this year so I'm very excited about that because American plum also makes a delicious jam. Um, so I started off with very small transplants and seedlings. Um, by late spring they're already just taking off like crazy. Um, natives being natives and the Chicago summer being wet and, and warm um, provided everything and so within a very short time I had a very green pot full of exciting plants. Um, all of them seem to be growing fairly well, some growing more fast than others. Um, and that I can talk a bit about that um, a bit later on. By the summer, it was completely covered in greenery. Um, there was a lot of things, some things even started to flower. You can sort of see a bit of a lobelia flowering in the corner here. Um, yeah, and so it, I was, and also onion, uh, nodding onion was also a good one. Um, and so the plants took off great. Um, 
as a gardener, I couldn't help tinkering and sort of trying to make space and making sure nothing was overcrowding anything else. Um, but I kept a careful eye on it um, and sort of watched. And then even by the fall, um, after a whole growing season, the colors, the fall colors, the golden colors of the grasses, the golden colors of the amelanchia all started to sort of give a nice golden light. Um, I would often see the Valkyrie in the evening. And so I always got this great sort of setting sun light that matched nicely with the gold colors. And so as, as a sort of fall transitioned in, the golden colors of the, the sunset and the golden colors of the plants really look kind of stunning from, from the balcony. And then even in winter, um, the plants were great that I left the pots out and I was like, okay, I'm going to see what happens. Let's see how these plants go um, with, you know, as much snow as we get and everything else. I put a little bit of mat on some of the plants during the winter, but mainly I tried to keep the snow when it did show up on the plants as often as I can, but it was irregular and not always there. And no, not surprising, well, a little bit surprising, everything came back the following spring. Well, not everything, that there is hit and miss, but quite a few things um, showed up the next spring. Um, colors looked great, greened up. Um, I was very surprised how many of the native plants seemed to survive of being in a frozen pot um, in very cold conditions. And so, um, yeah, I realized that this was going to work, um, that I think I could make this happen. And then I started to play ecologist and decide what I wanted to keep and what I didn't want to keep. Um, it's a very small place. Uh, fast growing plants can quickly dominate. So I realized I wanted a diversity of things in my pot. Um, and so this is where I started modifying my goals. I realized um, I could have a lot of echinacea, for example, did great. I could have just one big pot of echinacea and lots of great color, or I was going to aim for diversity. And so one thing you'll see with my pots, I don't have a very floristically abundant um, pots because I was trying to maximize the number of species I had per pot rather than maximize the display. Um, and that was just my choice. But if you want to maximize display, there are definitely a few candidates in here that would give you all round color and, and really some be kind of amazing. So I've been doing this for 15 years. Um, and now I can honestly say that I have a good sense of some of the plants that seem to do well over six years. So six years, they kept coming back. Um, they showed up at, every year. I will say there are very few examples of anything that lasted the full 15 years. Um, service berry being one of them that has got, this is a 15 year old tree out there. It's very bonsai. I trim it to keep it small and thing, but every year produces great flowers. Every year produces great berries. Um, some of the irises that, um, that I planted did great for six or seven years, flowered great. Um, recently, my irises have stopped flowering which is a sad because they were one of the best spring flowers. The Cyphia trichums, some of the asters were amazing. They're the perfect color in the fall. They flower abundantly. Everyone in my neighborhood loves seeing the sort of asters cascading down my pots. Um, and then Royal Catchfly, it never really, it never does a really huge display, but it always shows up and always has a few flowers. I will say I've never seen a hummingbird come to my balcony, unfortunately, but um, yeah. Um, here's a list of some species. Um, some of my favorites, um, Queen of the Prairie did pretty well. My my um, my wet prairie, Laetris did okay. Shows up a couple of times. Flowers pretty well. Rudbeckia and Retibia, Retibita, they just flower fantastically. Um, Verbena, Phloxes, there's some great um, great examples of species. Again, I'm happy to share the list if you want to have sort of a more detailed look at some of these. Um, some of the medium ones, and this might be stuff that you want, but, you know, you might get three to six years out of them, which is still, I think, worthwhile. Um, I am a gardener after one. I do like to tinker all the time. Um, and so I do love to take in and take out depending on my mood and what I'm feeling. Um, and so there were some plants that showed up um, quite often um, that I kind of liked that I keep putting back in because I keep hoping for some display. Um in Athera, this is a uh, Macrocarpa, which has a stunning big flower, um, very beautiful, um, that I like to see. Gentians are always fun, and dahlias are always always fun. Uh, and the Penstemon, 
um, is always a good spring color and also a favorite of many bees. Um, I did also, because I'm looking for diversity, I was really interested in making sure, I mean, living in Chicago, I wanted it green quickly, but I also wanted it to have something early. So as soon as spring came along, I could I would have some flowers in, in the pot. Um, Dodecathion, which is now Primula, I think, but um, shooting stars were wonderful on the far right here. Um, they're one of my favorites and it, it doesn't always come back, but I always put it back because um, I just love seeing it. Irises, as I mentioned, was one of my favorites. Is one of the first, usually flat flowered early June. Bell wart is probably one of my favorite woodland species in the world. I love this plant. Um, again, it shows up, st sticks around for a couple of years in flowers and then um, disappears. Um, but I'll always put it back. And the flocks, the, both the woodland flocks and the prairie flocks, both of them um, have a very interesting growth. Uh, they stay kind of green over the winter which I think is one of the reasons why they come and go if we have a really bad winter and they don't have a mulch protection. I think the primulas just die out. The top dies out completely and they don't reef sprout. But the phloxes are definitely something that I would highly recommend as far as pollinate attractant um, and just display. They're stunning. The, the amount of color you get out of them, they really fill up the balcony and my neighbors appreciate them as well. Summer, obviously, the prairie is a buzz with in the with flowers and pollinators. Um, so uh, there are so many species that I could get that flower in the summer. Um, some of them are, you know, again, I mentioned in the the what, evening primrose with flowers in the evening, and this is kind of interesting. I mean, I I do spend most of my time on the balcony in the evenings when I go for work, so having something that flowers in the evening is kind of fun. Um, Asclepius is one quite one I get a question about all the time. People so love to have milkweeds on the balcony. Um, milkweeds are hit, really hit and miss. I have found that the 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 more rhizomatous milkweeds um, do pretty well on the on the on the roof uh, on the prairie pots. Um, but things like uh, butterfly milkweed, um, even this uh, swamp milkweed. Tends to do okay. The I've never got the butterfly milkweeds over winter. And I've recently talked to some people in the planting community and they say, um, if you plant a transplant of a milkweed, it's less likely to overwinter than if you do seeds. And so I think if I'm gonna, I'm gonna try a butterfly milkweed again, because definitely some of the milkweeds do survive in pots, but I think there is the one exception where I'm gonna have to use seeds and not, um, transplants for those things. Um, Silene, I have uh, both Silene and Royal Cashfly, uh, the Silene and Lobelia, the Cardinal Flower. Um, both of these, just for their red color is stunning. Both of them do well in the pots, both of them show up. And Horse Bee Balm, um, it's, it's just a great performer. It's not as showy as, as some of the other bee balms, but as far as a pollinator attractor and just a beautiful, vigorous plant. Um, it always does great in the summer. I also try to make sure that the flowering goes all the way through. Um, so the asters, the golden rods, gentians are always a favorite um, for me. I love ha having gentians in the pot. They're hit or miss and don't always come back, but you know when they do come back, they're stunning. Um, asters do well. Every aster I planted, every golden rod I planted, um, they do great. I will say that more often than not, I'm pulling them out because they do too well. Um, I, I here I've got silky milk, silky aster, which um, it's less aggressive, and so I have kept it. It still grows and comes back every year, and it's a beautiful flower. So, um, depending on what you want, if you want a robust flowering plant that shows up and grows well and comes every year, things like New England aster will do amazing. Will give you a great display. They will quickly dominate the pot um, um, and that sort of thing. So. Again, to remind you, my 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 goal was diversity in the pot as much as display. So um, I often found myself removing some of that. So, so, um, the balcony was always a joy. Um, it like the flowering, everyone comments on all the color and the greenery and just even just the greenery, though. I mean, the peace and the oasis that having a green space outside your window um, provides um, to just sit there. 
I, I don't know if you can see there's my dog sitting there. Even he enjoys the uh, the nice, calm greenery, although he eats it as well, which is a great. But um, yeah, so I, I get some great displays. In the middle here, I have a, a period where I had so many things flaring all at the same time, um, which was also a joy um, if you can get it. Um, although normally I found that I had things sort of spattering, flowering. I always had something in flower, um, but very few had very large dominance flowers. So the main color I saw most of the year was green. Things I didn't like, like I said, I didn't want anything aggressive, um, but I will point out that things that are aggressive may be exactly what you're looking for, if that's your goal. Um, some of the goldenrods, New England's, even in this Coreopsis lanceolata, um, even Aquilegia, these four plants produced so many flowers, grew so well, grew so fantastically, produced great color, um, but they became the main thing in the pot very quickly, um, and which is not what I wanted. I'm a little disappointed with Aquilegia. I really love that plant, um, but the the native one does can loves living in a pot, loves growing big, loves producing lots of flowers. Um, so depending on your on what you call success. Um, what I call too aggressive may be the perfect plant for you in, in some situations. Things that I learned, um, grasses and sedges, even though may not be in the gardens because they have pretty flowers or may not be something you think about, um, I will say that I think more and more that I do this over the winters, that the more grasses and sedges I have established in the pot and the plants that grow in and within the grasses and sedges, over winter, far better than those that are just in empty pots in open soils. Um, so the thing I've learned is that uh, plants that have tap roots are the most likely, well, only a tap root, are the ones that are most likely to not survive very harsh winters or very harsh freezes. Um, grasses, which have very fibrous and fine roots, I think roots die when freezing, but not all of them, and so grow pretty well. But also grass and sedges, I think, bind the soil in a way that makes that freezing cycle not as harsh. And so many companion plants or plants planted within or around grasses and sedges tend to do way better. And there are a handful of plants such as lobelioids, some campanula, some phloxes, which don't fully die back in the winter, stay a little bit green. I think require something like a grass or a sedge to provide them the overwintering protection they need to come back. So. Definitely my lobelioids that aren't under a sedge do not do very well and probably don't come back. But the ones in and around grass and sedges do really well. Um, another lesson I learned is in the spring, birds are looking for nesting material and many of my little shoots would disappear. Some of my favorite spring flowering plants just couldn't handle the amount of aggressive bird harvesting of nesting material. Um, so... I have resorted in some cases to putting netting over my pots um, in the spring because the amount of nesting material that birds are collecting, um, which normally wouldn't harm a plant, but because my plant is just one small thing in a pot, um, they're impacted a little bit better. Um, I also have bird feeders out in my balcony and I've realized that all the debris that particularly sunflowers produces um, is not good for pots. Um, they produce a very dense and I've understand um, allopathic um, uh, chemicals which don't promote growth and I would find dead patches in my prairie on my pots wherever sunflower seeds got particularly dense or heavy so I have to be very careful with my birds and attracting birds um, at least watch the, them and how they interact in my prairie um, quite a bit all right so um, I'm going to sort of lead into, we have Nick Dorian here who's going to talk a little bit about some of the, I think many people, many of us, me included, um, when I'm growing these plants on the prairie, what I really want to do is provide me an oasis, a green space, somewhere relaxing and calm. But I also like the fact that it attracts many of the insects and the um, within my community and birds. Um, and so I just like to start off by showing you like where I live more to show you how much green space I'm living around, right? I'm in a very urban area of Chicago. The streets have a few trees along the line, lining the edges, but the amount of green space, the amount of sort of um, non-tree, non-grass communities in my area is very limited, right? And so there's a picture down my street. You can see there's a few trees. 
all great, but there's, you know, that's about all we've got. And then a picture from my balcony from the top. Um, what surprised me? Well, no, it didn't. I'm a scientist. I was not that surprised. But all these plants I knew were very beneficial to, to insects. Um, I think what surprised me is that insects will find them. Um, if they love that plant or if they're, you know, looking for the resources, um, it's surprising who shows up. I don't always see natives. A lot Sometimes it's, you know, just um, non-native bees, um, honeybees. But sometimes it's kind of fun native bees and usually the common ones. I'll let Nick tell you what's what, but you've, here's a few examples of some of my favorite pollinators, um, uh, pollinating plants. Um, this is uh, anise hyssop. Um, it it smells great and the bees love it. Um, Joe Pieweed, a funny looking flower that the insects love. Um, Camacrista fasciculata, it reseeds itself every year. Bees love these flowers, particularly um, bumblebees, which I don't have a photo of here. There's a wasp. Um, as I said, the horse nettle, uh, horse bee balm. Um, there's so many wasps that come to this. They love it. Um, they're big and intimidating looking, but they do sting. So um, it's a good training session for visitors when they come to my house. That These wasps are big and scary, but not usually threatening. Um, Latris is always great. We see a lot of latris. I see a lot of bees coming to my latris. And then, you know, we have wasps coming to my wilkweeds. And the verbenas do really well as well. Um, I get quite a few moths. Um, I, I don't get as many butterflies and moths as I would hope. I think a part of me would hope that I would see a lot more butterflies in my gardens. Uh, the phlox that is the big one. Phlox definitely attracts butterflies. I got swallowtail showing up, which is great. Um, but occasionally I'll get a few butterfly visitors, um, skippers and stuff straying by. And then, of course, I have my bird feeder and I have some great birds that come and stop by the prairie, which um, obviously makes me happy as well, sort of thing. Um, and squirrels don't make me as happy because they're, they're a little destructive. But, you know, they're still fun to watch. And my dog likes watching those ones. So, um, with that, I'm going to introduce Nick Dorian. Um uh, Nick is going to to finish off this talking a little bit more specifically about how, um, well, I'll let you tell, let him tell you what he's going to talk about. But um, Nick comes from us from Tufts University, where he got both his bachelor's degree and his PhD. Um, but he's a postdoc here at the Chicago Botanic Gardens, working with Paul Caradonna on bees um, and particularly urban bees. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and. Um, I'm excited to sort of uh, enrich and supplement Jeremy's talk with some information on the, the pollinators uh, that that are likely to visit your container garden, or even if you don't have a container garden, the, the plants that the pollinators that would visit your, your garden in general. So I'm going to take you on a little pollinator safari, I like to call. Um, and when, when we're on a safari, we look for some main insect pollinators. Those are insects that visit flowers and can ferry pollen uh, between, between flowers. Um, and I like to think of them as the big five. Let me go to the next slide. Um, the big five, bees, hoverflies, butterflies and moths will make us one category, wasps and beetles. And together these five groups of insects um, do the lion's share of, of pollinating um, and are gonna be our most common visitors. And so the, the structure of this, of this short talk will just be uh, taking us through the identification and a little bit of the ecology and flower preferences of these different groups uh, as a way of introducing you to your pollinator neighbors. So the bees, are, although we might think of them as, um, as just the European honeybee that, that lives in a big hive and is sort of striped and golden, bees are incredibly diverse. There's more than 500 species that live in Illinois and they come in every size, shape and color that you can imagine. There are green bees, there are red bees, there are orange bees, there are bees with green eyes, bees with blue eyes. There are bees bigger than rigatoni, bees smaller than orzo. Uh, our most common bee, uh, one of our most common bees is gonna be the bumblebee. Um, if we go to our next slide. 
Um, and bumblebees are very charismatic and in comet and they, they're very fuzzy. So the, the main color patterns of bumblebees in our area are, are yellow or, or sort of lemon yellow and black and, and various striping patterns of that. So this bumblebee in particular is the common Eastern bumblebee. And she's got a, uh, an all black face, which is how I know it's a female. Males have little yellow mustaches. Uh, and she has a yellow thorax, a yellow stripe on her abdomen and the rest of it is black. Um, and bumblebees are going to be seen throughout the year in your garden because of their social uh, lifestyle. So if we go to the next slide, in spring, queen bumblebees in just a couple of weeks, uh, in fact, maybe some of you have already seen them, are going to emerge um, and in search of a place to build their nest. Now, queens uh, are already mated. They mated in the fall. And she's going to zoom low around the ground and perhaps investigate even um, flowers on your balcony. And so you often hear them before you see them. And they're like little mini helicopters. And so here's a queen that is visiting uh, Eastern Redbud. Um, and she needs to sort of refuel uh, uh, after the long winter. So she drinks nectar and gathers pollen. You can see on her hind leg a little pellet of orange pollen that she's gathered. So in summer, when she started her, her uh, colony, uh, the workers uh, are all female, and they go out and gather pollen and nectar to build the hive. Uh, bees are vegans. Their diet is exclusively flower-based. Pollen is protein, nectar is carbohydrates. But within that, bumblebees visit a variety of flowers often related to the length of their tongue. So some of the bumblebees that have short tongues like visiting flowers that have very shallow corollas, uh, like uh, cherries and plums, you know, nine bark, wild roses, spirea, great choices. Um, others uh, like our um, American bumblebee or our uh, golden northern bumblebee, Bombus fervidus, have much longer tongues. And so you see them visiting flowers with much deeper corollas like baptisia or bee balm or thistles. And so this underscores like a key tenet of pollinator gardening, which is to attract a diversity uh, of, of insects, you want to have a diversity of flower shapes and sizes. Um, in fall after the colony, oh, oh yeah, I want to tell you this, this, yeah, if you go to that little gift. Uh, so another, another way you can engage with your pollinator neighbors is by listening to the bumblebees in summer. Uh, Chemicrista, you know, partridge pea, the pollen is locked up in tubular anthers and they need to be vibrated at just the right frequency. Uh, bumblebees are capable of this behavior called buzz pollination. And when they grab the flower, they bite it with their uh, mandibles and they shake vigorously, sort of like an electric toothbrush. And pollen just sort of uh, cascades out all over their body. So partridge pea and senna are two of our native plants that require buzz pollination, but also things like tomatillos, tomatoes, uh, cranberries, cherry, uh, uh, blueberries. Um, and you can even go up and inspect the flowers um, after they've uh, been visited um, and you'll see little bite marks on the anthers. They're little bruises that, ha that show you the bees have already visited. Um, you can still, if we go to the next slide, yeah, goldenrods and asters in the fall. So solidagos, uh, oligoneurons, and then also our, our wood asters like symphiatricums um, are key uh, pollen and nectar sources for males and new queens. So the workers are dying out, the old queens are dying out, and the next generation will uh, be visiting your, your flowers. The males and queens mate, the old males die, and the, only the queens are the ones that overwinter. And so this is another reason why having something blooming every week of the year in your container garden is important. Uh, you will get bumblebees visiting every week of the year if you have something because their colony life cycle is much longer. Um, if we go to the next slide, in contrast, most of our native bees actually don't, don't live in um, hives. Uh, the vast majority are solitary. So every female builds her own nest. And as a result, she's active only for a few weeks every year. Um, some of our bees are, our solitary bees are ground nesting bees. Um, so if we, if we go to the next slide. Uh, and in, in a, just a couple of weeks, these uh, orange bees, these are Dunning's mining bees are very common in suburban landscapes. They nest often in uh, lawns that are maybe a little less kempt, so they're friends with lazy gardeners, and uh, they'll build these little sort of soil mounds in the, in the dirt. Uh, and you know it's a bee, not an ant, 
because the entrance of the hole is about the width of a pencil, not uh, a piece of spaghetti, uh, to continue our pasta analogies. Uh, and these bees, bees are spring active. Um, and so they like cherry trees and, and all to vis visit in the canopy. Um, and I'm sure they would, they're visitors to, to Jeremy's uh, amelanc here. Um, uh, there are other bees that nest above ground. Uh, some of you may have heard of mason bees or orchard bees that you can mail order to help pollinate your cherry trees. I don't recommend that you order bees to your property. Um, it, it's often there's issues with transferring disease around the country. But if you plant native plants like uh, apple trees or, or cherry trees, those are sufficient enough to uh, to attract the orchard bees uh, to your yard. Um, in the summer, uh, orchard bees are replaced by a different kind of bee that lives above ground, our leafcutter bees. Now, the thing that unifies these two bees is that they carry pollen under their bellies. So in one of Jeremy's photos, he had a bee cruising in and you could see the underneath of her belly um, was bright white or bright orange, depending on the pollen she's gathering. Uh, if you're not sure you have these bees in your yard, you can also look for clues that they've been around. Oh yeah, th that next slide right there is perfect. Yeah, so the mason bees are called mason bees uh, because in addition to needing pollen and nectar to build their homes, they also need other resources. So mason bees are given their name because they gather mud from uh, muddy banks. So if you have a little muddy pile where you can't seem to get anything to grow, take a look. If it's wet, there might be mason bees gathering a ball of mud like this female is between her mandibles. And if you grow things like redbud um, or uh, roses on your in your property, take a look on the margins of the leaves. Little leafcutter bees will come and slice discs out of the edges of the leaves to line their nests um, and make little safe homes for their babies back home. It doesn't destroy the plant or, or harm the plant. Um, and it's a clue uh, that an insect uh, is in your is in your neighborhood. Another thing when we're considering supporting our pollinators is the fact that many of our native bees don't visit every flower. So bumblebees and some of our leafcutter bees are fairly generalized in the flowers they visit and lots of different um, choices will do. However, there are bees that are very, very picky eaters. There are bees that only visit ironweed, Vernonia. There are bees that only visit wood asters, Symphiotrichum, like this longhorn bee here. And then there are bees that only visit sunflowers and silphiums. Um, a, the, my favorite story is the, the sunflower bees go out to your balcony um, at night, shine a little flashlight where the ray petals hit the disc. And in that junction, you'll see three, four, five male bees sleeping. Uh, and a little slumber party. And it's like late June, late July, early August. Um, and male bees can't sting. And so it's a really safe activity to get up close and personal with these insects. Um, so some key pollen plants, which I'm so glad overlap with a lot of Jeremy's recommendations, um, besides the, the the shrubs like, you know, salix and, and prunus and, and cornus, you know, bee balm and thistles and sunflowers and ironweeds and wood asters, all of these plants are great choices in part because there are bees for whom they're their only source of pollen. So there are bee balm short face bees that only visit Monarda fistulosa. There are sunflower longhorn bees that only visit sunflowers and silphium. There are ironweed bees that don't like sunflowers, but do like uh, Vernonia asters. Um, and so trying to incorporate some of these plants into your, your gardens ensures that we're increasing the diversity of insects that we can potentially attract. Uh, so some solitary bees that you might be able to spot, Dunning's mining bee in a couple of weeks, you might have, a if you have a yard, um, uh, a little, a little uh, sort of dryish slope, they'll come out and swarm around the ground, or you might see them on your when you're walking your dog. Um, they're common in parks and, and suburban yards. In summer, the bicolored striped sweat bee, this bee absolutely, absolutely, absolutely loves echinacea. Like it is its favorite flower. and um, they're very common in urban areas. So almost certainly this bee is on the echinacea like if you're growing it. Um, and then there's an all black bee that called the two spotted longhorn bee, which um, shows up on a variety of plants, including bee balm, but also it likes zinnias. And if you grow corn, it loves corn um, and also squash flowers. So very common in vegetable gardens as well. Um, and all three bees are solitary and, and very gentle, but 
this is a gentle introduction to, to bee watching. Um, butterflies and moths are also likely to show up in your garden. Um, so one thing that distinguishes butterflies and moths, if, if you don't know, is not that moths are often active at night and butterflies are active during the day, but rather that their antennae are clubbed. So butterflies have a little uh, bulbous tip at the end of their antennae that you can see here on this monarch, um, whereas moths' antennae are either simple or, or feathered. Um, so we have, uh, um, yeah, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Butterflies um, need two different resource requirements throughout their life cycle. So whereas bees get their nutrition from flowers, um, butterfly adults get their nutrition from flower nectar and butterfly larvae get their nutrition from leaves. So planting a garden to attract butterflies not only means including plants that the adults need, but thinking smartly about how we might provide food for caterpillars. So the monarch butterfly is a great example. Um, and I think many of you probably know that the caterpillars can only eat milkweeds, um, you know, grow those milkweeds from seed for your container garden. Um, and, and the adults, while they will visit milkweed flowers, they have a much longer activity period. And so they also need fall blooming flowers like goldenrods and asters to complete their migration south. Black swallowtails are another butterfly you can see in your garden. So the adults are fairly generalized nectar visitors, but the larvae need to eat members of the carrot family. Now they'll visit parsley uh, that you grow or fennel. And so this is a great way of, of making pollinator, um, uh, that your garden can grow both food for you and food for pollinators. Um, but a native plant for your container that's quite um, attractive to this butterfly is uh, golden alexanders, zizia. And um, uh, there's two, two kinds of zizia that uh, are suitable host plants for the black swallowtail and, and seem to be fairly short in stature, although short-lived. Uh, pearl crescents are another common butterfly in suburban and urban landscapes. And this is, I love this photograph because it's the adult visiting the flowers of white wood aster for nectar, which is the same plant that the caterpillars eat. So you can get two for one. You can provide nectar for adults and larval food for caterpillars. So any of our wood asters are suitable sources uh, for growing pearl crescents in your garden. Uh, Peck skipper, they zip around the city. They just like a stone skipping across the water, these skippers just bounce from flower to flower. Uh, you can see this tiny butterfly about the size of a dime um, drinking nectar with its long proboscis from this swamp milkweed. Um, and indeed, milkweeds are a really champion provider of nectar for, for butterflies. But Joe pie weeds as well, as Jeremy presented, are also great sources of, of nectar for lots of different kinds of butterflies. These butterflies have an interesting host plant. It's the variety of grasses, um, including um, peck skippers. They also use like Bermuda grass in, in yards. Um, so, so maybe you don't necessarily need to plant Bermuda grass on your, your container. Your um, and then I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about at least one moth that um, is likely to visit your balcony. This is the snazzy Hammerus thisbe hummingbird clearwing moth. Um, these are day flying moths, so you don't even need to be out at night to visit to, to see them. And at first, you're just like, Whoa, what is that? Is that a hummingbird? It, it looks a little weird. Um, these moths have uh, bright red wings that are clear, um, and they often hover uh, while drinking nectar. So, here's one that I photographed at the Chicago Botanic Garden visiting um, ironweed flowers. Um, but because of their long tongues, they like tubular flowers, and so uh, Monarda. Fistulosa is another great choice uh, for attracting them. To raise the Hemorrhous thisbe, so to, to actually grow the adults, you, you need different vegetation. Uh, viburnums um, are a great choice for uh, as a host plant for hummingbird clear wings, but they also use honeysuckles and things like that. Now, this is where it starts to get tricky. Bees are hairy, butterflies and moths like unmistakable with their big wings, but there's lots of other insects that sort of masquerade as others and hoverflies are one of those groups. So hoverflies are common visitors to uh, gardens, uh, especially in the balconies, um, but it's often tricky to know that you have a hoverfly. Unlike bees, hoverflies have two big bulging eyes that often sort of crowd into each other. They have very stubby antennae, so their antennae are not long at all. 
And then their wings are often held out in a triangle. Um, and so those three features together sort of are clues that you have a, a hoverfly and not a bee. One hoverfly that you might come across is the drone fly, which is a really, really, really effective mimic of the European honeybee. And in fact, this drone fly is cosmopolitan in distribution. You find it on all uh, continents uh, from Australia to North America. Uh, and But you'll notice that this hoverfly has got wings held out in a triangle, really big eyes, and short antennae. Now, hoverflies don't have long tongues. And so visiting things with deep corollas like bee balm, uh, really not a thing that flies do. You'll find them on, on shorter flowers like Queen Anne's lace or, or yarrow. Eastern calliclifers, I imagine many of you are familiar with these. They're much tinier, sort of gnat sized. And when they land on flowers, they have a tendency to sort of pulse their abdomens up and down. Um, these are maybe about a fifth the size of our drone flies. And instead of black eyes, they have big red eyes, and you'll notice the wings held out in short antennae. I think many gardeners, especially vegetable gardeners, love calligraphers. Uh, their larvae are aphidophagus, meaning they eat aphids. So they provide double ecosystem service. The adults pollinate and the larvae are pest control. This is my favorite fly. This is the Eastern Hornet fly. What, what a mimic. This is like the most effective yellow jacket mimic I've ever encountered. Um, I know it's not a bee because bees rarely just land on flowers, uh, on leaves like this. Flies have a tendency of, of resting on vegetation um, in addition to visiting flowers. Uh, these guys develop in, in wood, rotting logs. And so you often find them near forested areas. Um, but they do manage to make it into the city, and especially if you live near a forest preserve. Um, and they are very fond of Beckias, uh, goldenrods, and asters. Everybody's favorites, wasps. And it, in fact, I, I was not a bug kid growing up. I was kind of terrified of, of insects, in part because I had some pretty negative interactions with wasps that, that stung me. Um, but unfortunately, uh, about 1% of wasps, the social wasps, give all the other wasps a really bad rep. Uh, so most of our wasps, like most of our bees, are, so are solitary and very gentle uh, and are something that we can, we can appreciate rather than fear. So some things that set wasps apart uh, from other insects is that um, their wings are often folded, um, often held out to the side. Um, they're often not very hairy at all. Their legs have spines on them uh, and they have long antennae. Now you'll notice that many of the flies we looked at actually resemble wasps more than bees. Um, uh, and some things that wasps have are, are really skinny waists that bees don't have. If you're seeing an insect at your picnic, it is not a bee. Bees are vegans, they don't like steak. Wasps are scavengers, carnivores, especially our social wasps. And uh, they love to visit our picnics, especially in late fall when the queen wasp has sort of uh, lost control of the workers and the workers are, are, are now feeding for themselves rather than gathering caterpillars to grow the, the hive. You can see evidence of, of yellow jackets. Uh, oh yeah, next slide would be great. Um, you can see evidence of yellow jackets, the Dolica vesculas, which are the aerial yellow jackets. Uh, I just took this walking down the street uh, outside of Logan Square the other day. Um, and uh, so while some of our yellow jackets live below ground, others, including our bald faced hornets, our big black and white baddies, they also build these hanging basketballs out of paper, which is wood scraping that they've carved out of your deck or out of your untreated or unpainted pots. Um, and these hives are not perennial. There are no hornets waiting to emerge in mass next year. Instead, just like bumblebees, queens, queen hornets go underground or beneath logs, hibernate, and then emerge to build a hive in a new place again. And we, although hornets can be mean, we like them. They eat a lot of biting flies. And so they provide these pest controls, uh, at, with, with, which without them, uh, our lives, I think, would, would have a lot more uh, nuisance in sex. Uh, Jeremy alluded to some of the big wasps that visit his containers. Uh, and the great black digger wasp, Spex pensylvanicus, is, is one of those common visitors. The adults uh, love, love, love mints. 
So they love mountain mints, pycnanthemums, and they love monarda, especially monarda punctata, the dotted or horse mint. The adults are big, but really gentle. Um, and they have, they're all black with a skinny waist and blue iridescent wings. Uh, in addition to needing nectar for energy, the larvae of wasps uh, do not eat pollen like bee larvae. The larvae of wasps eat other insects. And just like there are specialist bees, all of our wasps are fairly specialized in the prey items that they take. So Spex wasps are katydid hunters and they're gonna hunt crickets that live in trees on the street and bury them underground uh, paralyzed so that the larvae can eat an alive but immobilized cricket. If we go to our next slide, oh, the cicada killers. These are another, um, again, fierce but gentle um, uh, wasp that is common in Chicago throughout the summer. Many of you may have seen their big burrows near ball fields. Uh, the entrance to the burrow is like the size of a, a quarter. Uh, and there's often many of them and the, the males are hovering around. Now, just like male bees, male wasps can't sting. Um, uh, and to attract these um, bu button bush, as I'm seeing in the comments, button bush is a great choice for um, attracting and feeding cicada killers. Now, cicada killers um, are not uh, active in sync with our periodical cicadas. So we're having the big brood 1913 emerge in a couple of months and cicada killers are gonna be out after that, uh, um, that brood is, those broods have emerged. And that's because they feed on a much more reliable food source. Rather than having to time their life cycle to match up with once every 13 or 17 years, our annual cicada killers track annual cicadas. These are the cicadas that are active in late July and August in Chicago. Um, and then our last wasp uh, is the bee wolf. So bee wolves, true to their name, specialize on bees. These are wasps that hunt pollen carrying bees, sting them and bring them underground for their larvae to eat. Takes about five to 10 bees to make a bee wolf. And I think that's just something to underscore is that pollinator gardens grow other insects uh, and emphasizing species interactions when you're thinking about plantings is really important. So when you plant an aster this year, that's going to feed a bee. That bee will produce offspring that next year feed a bee wolf. And so every, these interactions just sort of multiply uh, to create this really interesting uh, community of insects in your, in your backyard. The last member of our pollinator safari is the beetle. Uh, these beetles uh, are, this is the red milkweed beetle. They eat the roots of common milkweed and then adults emerge to feed on the flowers uh, and the vegetation. Uh, beetles have segmented antennae, so often very bumpy. They're not very hairy, and their wings are held beneath a sheath, which is called the elytra. One of our common beetle visitors are the flower longhorn beetles. Plants that you can grow to attract them are spirea and shrubby dogwoods. Um, and adults actually eat pollen. So these are, uh, be beetles need to eat pollen in order to reproduce. However, they're not the best flyers. They're kind of clumsy. And so they bounce around from flower to flower, um, but do get the job done, especially on the real stinky flowers. Uh, another option would be something like uh, elderberry. These are really common. I would be surprised if you hadn't encountered them at some point. These are goldenrod soldier beetles. So bright yellow beetles that are really common on asters and goldenrods in the fall. Um, and the adults eat nectar, um, but you often see them near prairie and grassland areas because the larvae are ravenous consumers of grasshopper eggs. Grasshopper eggs are laid in the soil. The eggs of the goldenrod soldier beetle laid in the soil. And when these beetle eggs hatch, the little larvae sort of worm their way through the soil and just munch, 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 munch on goldenrod eggs, uh, on grasshopper eggs. Um, the locust borer is, I believe, uh, our last uh, uh, beetle uh, of, our, of our virtual safari. Uh, and these, again, are really common in the fall. The adults uh, are really fond of all of our street trees, our black locusts and our honey locusts, and the larvae bore into those trees. 
Um, and then the adults are found on basically no flowers other than goldenrod. Um, and I know this is not a bee because of those segmented antennae and the elytra that are covering the wings. You don't see any wings held up to the side. And also they're just really, really clumsy flyers in the most endearing way. So this is all to say is let's go pollinator watching. I've written a guide uh, with my colleague called watchingbees.com that covers identification in the field of 50 common bees that you'll find in your backyard um, around, the, around the area. You can grab a pair of Papilio Pentax binoculars, which are close focus binoculars that help you identify and, and sort of get up close um, with, with your pollinator neighbors. And then I love these nature bound bug vacuums. They're like, they're children's toys and they're double A battery operated and they sort of vacuum up an insect very gently. You twist the dial, there's a magnifying glass to sort of take a look at what's inside and then you release it. Um, and it's just sort of neat to, to help you watch insects that can actually be quite fast on the flowers. Um, so anyway, thank you so much for this opportunity, this real fast rundown of pollinators. Um, if y'all want to go out in the field this summer, we can we can make that happen. Um, I love leading these in-person safaris as well. So uh, thanks so much for your attention and I'm excited to answer questions.